And today we're going to continue our series, Go. Based off of the words of Jesus in Mark 16, 15, where he says this. He says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Jesus says, go into all the world. Here at Love Joy Church, how we go is through missions. And our missions is called Global Outreach. And I like calling it global outreach because when you abbreviate it, it's G-O, go, like the words of Jesus that said go. And we support about 30 missionaries and missions organizations all over the world who are going into all the world, preaching the gospel, helping people. Even during this time, we get stories of how God is still moving during this coronavirus pandemic. It's amazing. Last year, our church faithfully gave to them. And this year, we're asking again for the next 12 months, would we continue to give, not including our tithes or offerings, but something above that, just to our Go Fund, our Global Outreach Fund, so we could continue to support these missionaries. And the reasons we ask people to let us know by going to lovejoy.org slash go, lovejoy.org slash go. The reason we ask people to let us know is so we could let our missionaries who are on the field the missionaries who are all over the world, some local, some all over the world, who are doing God's work, we can let them know that, hey, you can count on us. You can count on our support. And so thank you for doing that. We're over 90%. We're almost there. And so if anyone's planning on giving and haven't told us, please let us know at lovejoy.org slash go. Or if you want to start giving, we'd love to reach our goal to continue to support all these amazing men and women around the world. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but on our Facebook page, every Monday we've been releasing a video of some missionaries that we support uh, because of your giving. And so it's been really great. You can check those out on Facebook. But thank you, church, for being just, just so awesome. And as we'll see this morning, that many times to go, whether it's throughout the whole world or simply in our own home, takes sacrifice, takes hard work, and it's not really always appealing. I mean, let's be honest. We know the words of Jesus to go into all the world, but sometimes an opportunity arises to go, and we're chock full of excuses. Am I right? We have excuses. I'm too busy. I just can't. I, I'm too tired. Not, you know, it's just a bad week. If it wasn't this week, any other week, but I can't this week. We have tons of excuses. You know, what? I think somebody else will help them. You know what? I don't even know if they want, why would they want me to help them? I don't think they want my help. And those are just my excuses. <laughs> All right, I don't know what excuses you have. Those are just the excuses I have. It's, I'm lucky though in my life because I'm so close to the Holy Spirit that whenever I start coming up with excuses, the Holy Spirit really pushes me to do, well actually, my wife pushes me to help other people. Uh, all the time, she gently volunteers me to help other people, and she's kind of that angel by my side who, whenever I'm full of excuses, she encourages me to go. In fact, just this past weekend, true story, we're outside with our kids, and someone's motorcycle breaks down right next to our house, right on the side of the road. And so it breaks down. They're all angry. They leave. They come back with a pickup truck. Now, I don't know why they call them pickup trucks, but I think they call them a pickup truck because if you ever want to take something and put it in the truck, you have to pick it up really high to get it in the back of the truck. And so there's four or five young guys, and, and they're trying to get this motorcycle in the back of the pickup truck. This is true. And my wife is telling me, to go over there and help them. I don't want to go. I don't want, why would I go over there and help them? I don't know them. They don't even want my help. They didn't ask me. You think they want me to help them? My wife goes, Jonathan, you're the biggest person around. You don't think they want your help. So finally, the Holy Spirit convicted, I mean, my wife convicted me to go and help these people. By the time I got over there, they had the front wheel of the motorcycle on the tailgate of the pickup truck and the back wheel of the motorcycle still on the ground. So it was tilted like this, leaning on the pickup truck. I was like, hey, guys, you want some help? They're like, do we want some help? I'm like, yeah, we'd love some help. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, where can we grab it? They're like, that's the issue. We can't really grab it anywhere without breaking it. It's too heavy for us to pick up. And so I was just like, all right, just let me just do it. And so I grabbed this wheel, and I pick it up and throw it on the pickup truck. I did the motorcycle, and I helped these people out. They were very thankful. Uh, but this morning, I want to share with you a story of a man who had all the excuses, just like me. And all the reasons not to help someone in need. Yet, despite that, he chose to do the right thing. We call it the story of the Good Samaritan. So I want to look at this story in Luke chapter 10. We're going to start at the kind of beginning how Jesus comes about telling this story. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 25, it starts with this. On one occasion, an expert in the law 
stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now, this is a great question. How do we inherit eternal life? It's a great question we should all be asking. But to answer this question, it's interesting that Jesus took the expert in the law and told him to go back into the law and read it. What does that mean? Well, I could take it to mean that knowing the law is a good thing. Knowing God's word is really important. It's important to study, to read, and to know it in your head. But as we keep reading we will see that it's not just knowing it in your head that's important, but it's knowing it in your heart and living it out, which is also very important. Jesus says, if you do this, you will live. If you do it, if you act it out, if you live, not just know it, but if you do it. In fact, there's a scripture in James that says, faith without works, faith without action, faith without living it out is dead. It's not real faith at all. And so as we're going to see throughout this whole message, it's more than just knowing what to do in our head, but it's doing it. It's knowing it in our heart and living it out. Verse 29, let's continue the story, says this. But he, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now this is a really interesting scripture verse. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but why would this expert in the law need to justify himself after Jesus just told him he gave the correct answer? Now, if this was me, I'm just being honest. If this was me, I stand up and I'm talking to the son of God and we're having a discussion and I, he, he asked me a question and I respond and he said, yeah, you're right. Man, I would have walked out of there, head up high, chest out, patting myself on the back, letting everybody know. Like, I just had a discussion with Jesus. Yup, the Son of God. He didn't Jesus juke me. He didn't confuse me. He did not whip me. I gave the right answer. I would have, I mean, I would have never even said anything for the rest of my life. Why would I need to speak to God? I just gave Jesus, the Son of God, the right answer. Yet, this expert in the law felt like he needed to justify himself. Why? I think he was being convicted. I think he felt guilty. I think he felt guilty because he knew the law. He was an expert in the law. He knew it in his head, but he wasn't living it out. He didn't know it in his heart. James 4, 17 says this. Remember, it's a sin to know what to do and not to do it. It's a sin if you know what you ought to do. This guy knew what he ought to do, but maybe he wasn't really doing it. And to justify himself, he said, Jesus, but who is my neighbor? He sought more information, more I's to dot, T's to cross. He wanted more laws to follow. He'd rather keep talking in the vein for which Jesus commended him because he felt he could justify himself better in speech rather than in practice. But it wasn't more information he needed. He needed a new heart. And now with this question in mind, we might have expected Jesus to tell us a story about who a Jew, about it maybe a Jew, should love anybody, even a despised Samaritan. Right? A Jew, all of Jesus' audience right now were Jews. They were all listening to him, and you would think, oh, Jesus is going to tell a story about us Jews. We should help everyone, even Samaritans. But Jesus, in his brilliance, shows how even a Samaritan, who's not a full-blooded Jew, a Samaritan who, who uh, worships in the wrong temple, who doesn't follow all the right laws, Samaritan who is rejected, could be even nearer to God than a full-blooded, devout Jewish person. The expert asked Who is my neighbor? Who is the person I should help? But in Jesus' answer, he suggests that maybe that isn't the best question we should ask. Maybe we shouldn't ask, who is my neighbor? Because here's the problem. If we ask, who is my neighbor, if we define who our neighbor is, then that also means there are people we shouldn't help. If we define who we should help, 
that means there's maybe a group of people we shouldn't help. If all these categories work, these are the people we help, then that leaves people that we don't have to help. Jesus suggests that perhaps the better question is not who is my neighbor, but do I behave as a neighbor? Or you can say this, do I behave as a person who helps others? Am I a good neighbor? In fact, the title of my message this morning is this, good neighbors. Good neighbors. Having good neighbors is important. Wherever you move, wherever you go, you want to know how's the neighborhood. How are the neighbors? In fact, if you look at a house in a really, really bad neighborhood, it's way cheaper than the exact same house in a really, really good neighbor. Why? Because the neighborhood, your neighbors, having good neighbors is important. I'm very fortunate that where we live, our home we bought, we have really, really great neighbors. In fact, one neighbor in particular is the nicest person I've ever met. He lets me borrow whatever I want. He helps me out all the time. He's so nice. I'm telling my wife one day, I'm saying, listen, I, 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 we're just so lucky we have these neighbors. He's so nice. He's so helpful. And all of a sudden, I got like nervous. I was like, wait a minute, this non-Christian neighbor is nicer than his Christian pastor neighbor. And all of a sudden, I, I'm like all worried. I'm like, how could other people be nicer than me? And God is beginning to work a question in me, not who is my neighbor, not who is nice to me, but am I a good neighbor? Am I someone who helps others? How can we go wherever we are in life? How can we go into all the world? How can we do what Jesus called us wherever we are in life? How we do that is we learn to be a good neighbor. Let's continue the story. In verse 30, it says this. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, let's just stop there, and let me set the scene to the story of the Good Samaritan. We have to keep in mind that the people listening to Jesus' story knew this route from Jerusalem to Jericho. And they knew it quite well. It's kind of like this. When you were to tell a story to a bunch of your buddies and you tell them about a specific street you guys grew up on or a specific spot in your work or your school, they all know it. And when you mention it, they can all visualize it and feel it and remember what it's like because it's so familiar. In fact, there's a joke my grandpa Berngaster used to tell me about being familiar is there was um, this guy, he joined a con construction crew and he just new to this construction crew and they're working, they're working, they go on their lunch break and they're all sitting there on lunch and, and all of a sudden as they're eating lunch, someone yells out, 15! And all of a sudden everyone just starts laughing. A little bit later, somebody yells out, 23! They all start laughing again. A little bit later, someone yells out, 7! And they all start laughing again, and, and, and this guy can't figure out what's going on, and he asks one of his friends, like, well, what's happening at lunch? People yell a number, they all laugh. He said, oh, well, we've been here so long, working so much together, that we just started telling the same jokes over and over and over again. So instead of telling the entire joke, since we're so familiar with it, we know it so well, we've just numbered the jokes. And so you just have to say a number, and we remember the joke, and we laugh. And so the next day, this guy, they're at lunch, and he's like, man, I want to fit in, I want people to like me, and so... They're sitting there eating lunch, and he's like, I'm going to take a whack at this, you know? And so he yells out, 17! Nobody laughs. He's like, what? He's like, I'm going to try it again. 28! Nobody laughs. He turns to his friend. He goes, why isn't anybody laughing? He goes, oh, it's all in the delivery. But anyways, uh, he was telling the joke wrong. But my point is this. Uh, we could be so familiar with stuff that it helps us to visualize what's happening. It's like when I used to play basketball in this one really, 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 really bad neighborhood. There was fights every time we would play. In fact, it got so bad, they shut the league down, and they said we couldn't play unless we had armed security. And what's funny is we all remember it. And so when I just mentioned that place to my buddies we used to play basketball with, we could see it in our heads. And that's exactly what's happening when Jesus begins to tell this story. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notoriously dangerous for multiple reasons. First of all, to travel from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles. Now, that's not that big of a deal. But what's crazy is Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho is near the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is like 1,300 feet below sea level. 
So in just 17 miles, it's estimated that you descend about 3,400 feet in 17 miles. Not to mention this, the road was full of, it was narrow, and uh, the road, this was a road of narrow, rocky defiles. Now, if you don't know what the word defile is in this scenario, don't worry, I don't know either. So I looked it up for us so we could all know what I'm talking about. And a defile is a very steep and narrow road, usually in the mountains. And a defile is when the road gets really, really narrow, and on one side you kind of have the mountain, and on the other side you just have a cliff. So you can just, boom, fall right over and go down the whole mountain. It's so narrow that when an army would march through it, the army would have to, when they get to a defile, they would have to go single file. They would have to defile in order to get around it and march in single file file. Why do I say that? Because this route was dangerous. It was full of sharp, sudden turns and corners, and all these factors made it the perfect place for robbers to hang out. What's so wild is that throughout history, it confirms the dangers of this route, and not just thousands of years ago, but as early, as recent as the 1930s. You could read stories of people being told, if you're going to take this route, get home before dark. Because it's known that robbers wait and they hold up cars robbing travelers and tourists and they escape in the hills before the police could arrive. And so when Jesus told this story, he was telling about the kind of thing that was constantly happening on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And his audience was very familiar with this. And with all that being said, what does that tell you about the traveler in this story? Well, the traveler was most likely a bit reckless and a little irresponsible. Why? Because look how dangerous it is. Everyone knew how dangerous it was. He shouldn't have traveled alone. Most people traveled in groups or in caravans along these routes. The traveler did something a bit stupid. He had no one to blame but himself. And here's the thing. Every single one of us has done something stupid. In fact, my dad used to call it this. Sometimes the spirit of stupid comes on you, and you just do something. You just don't think about it. It's just dumb. It's a mistake. We've all done something. We're looking back on it. Yes, we'd never do it again. That was, it was all essentially our fault. We have no one to blame but ourselves. It could have been avoided, yet here we are. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to have somebody in our lives who even when you make a boneheaded mistake, even when you do something stupid, they're willing to help you for no reason at all, but because they love you. For those of us who are fortunate enough to have people like that in our lives, we understand the importance of being a good neighbor. I've made tons of boneheaded mistakes in my life. But luckily, I've had many people come alongside of me, whether it was a teacher, a coach, a parent, a friend, who even though I had no one to blame but myself, they helped me. Let's continue the story. Verse 31 and 32 says this. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, some versions say a temple assistant, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now let's stop there. I'm sure there are a ton of excuses why the priest and the Levite, the temple assistant, ignored this man in need. Maybe the priest had been serving God all week and he was excited to go home and and see his family. Perhaps the bandits were still lurking in the vicinity and using the victim as bait, which is a very common technique back then. And he thought, well, why take a chance? Maybe the road was particularly busy that day. And and he thought, well, I'm sure someone else who's better equipped, someone else is going to help this guy. I'm going to keep going. And besides any other excuses we could think of, it really wasn't the priest or the Levite's fault that this guy got beat up. I mean, it was kind of this guy's fault, right? He shouldn't have traveled alone. So they didn't really need to help him. But I want to share with you two thoughts and one question about this story. And the first thought is this. A lack of love is often easily justified, but never right. A lack of love is often easily justified, but it's never, never right. You can come up with as many excuses as you'd like, but it never makes your lack of love okay. 
Now, I could come up with some great excuses. Let me tell you something. Some of my excuses are really good, okay? I got some great excuses that I could pull out, but it never, ever makes it right. In fact, one commentary suggests that neighbor means someone who is near me, and maybe the priest and the Levite, they decided to go on the other side of the road because they're like, well, if he's not near me, I won't have to help them. Yet when we listen to the words of Jesus in Mark 16, 15, where he says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, what happens when you go? You bring people who are far away near you, and now you're their neighbor. This is why it's so important that we continue to support all these missionaries, because they're going throughout the world, and they're being good neighbors, helping people, preaching the gospel, giving food, training people, giving what others need, helping basic human life, giving that to other people. We need to go. And we need to keep supporting our missionaries. But let's continue the story. Verse 33 to 35 says this. But a Samaritan, the priest and the Levite passed them by. Now a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now this is where the story gets really interesting because before Jesus started the story, his Jewish listeners would have thought that Jesus would portray a Samaritan in need and how a Jewish person was so great that they would come along and help this Samaritan even though they were enemies. And yet, we see the first two people who come by were Jews. And they didn't help the guy. In fact, it was a priest and a Levite. They knew the law, but they didn't live it out. And all of a sudden, the Samaritan comes on the scene. If you were a Jew listening to the story, you would have thought Jesus just had another villain enter the story. That's how deep the hatred was for Jews and Samaritans. You would have thought, oh, the story went from bad to worse now that the Samaritan is on the scene. Yet, he was the least likely of those to help Yet he, to everyone's surprise, was the one who helped the man in need. Even this despised Samaritan, the enemy of the Jew, who doesn't know the law like the Jews know, was the one who helped. Finish the story here in verses 36 and 7. says this, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Here's my second thought is this. You can serve no matter where you come from. You can serve no matter where you come from. To this expert in the law, the person least likely to act correctly would be this Samaritan. In fact, he disliked the Samaritan so much that when he answered Jesus' question, he didn't even say the word Samaritan. He said to the one who showed mercy. The expert in the law had head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. The Samaritan was rejected and despised, the least likely to help an enemy, a Jew. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a temple worker. He wasn't even a Jew, yet he still acted in love and service towards someone in need. And no matter where you come from, whether it's from rags to riches, whether it's good or bad, you can still serve others. Location, geography, race, creed, social background, economic status, your feelings for or against someone have nothing to do whether you are a good neighbor or not. The only thing that matters is if someone's in need and you're able to help fulfill that need. You could serve others no matter where you're from, no matter your background, no matter your past. Jesus ended the story by saying, Go, go and do likewise. Go and be like this good Samaritan. Go and be a good neighbor. And so I feel it's fitting as we close this series called 
go, we look at the words Jesus ended in this story where he said, go and do likewise. Go and be a good neighbor. And so it's fitting to me at the end of the series to end with a question. And the question is this, am I a good neighbor? Am I a good neighbor? Global outreach, G-O, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go and do likewise. We need to go. We need to continue to support all these missionaries. We need to continue to be the church. But we also need to go and do likewise and live it out in our own lives. According to Jesus, there were four elements to truly loving God. At the beginning of the story, he said, how do you have eternal life? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. Well, our heart is our adoration. It's our worship for God. Our will is our, our soul is like a will and our commitment to God. Our mind is our faith and our belief in God. And our strength, which is our body, is how we physically live out God's love practically. Our strength is how we physically and practically live out the other three, our heart, soul, and mind. And maybe you are like me. You know what you should do, but you just don't do it. The Apostle Paul said it perfectly in Romans. He goes, so the trouble is not with the law. The the trouble is with me. I don't really understand myself. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. I've often found, especially in my life, usually at that point when you know what you ought to do, but you don't do it, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. The condition of my heart will determine the perspective of my eyes. Everyone in the story viewed the man attacked by robbers differently. The expert in the law, he viewed him as a topic for discussion. The robbers as a victim to exploit. The priest and the Levite as a nuisance to avoid. But only the Samaritan viewed him as a person to love, to serve, and to lead. And yet, it was the Samaritan who was the least likely to do this. He was the one who helped. The one no one would have thought would help was the one who can help. Listen, we could easily come up with excuses and justify our lack of love, but it's never right. And just like the Samaritan, it doesn't matter where you're from. You could always serve others. And so I guess the last thing to discuss is, am I a good neighbor? If when you honestly ask yourself that question, if you don't like the answer, or you're feeling like you need to justify yourself, if you're acting like the expert in the law who needed to justify himself, then might I gently and lovingly, in a way where I want to build you up, not tell you you're bad, but in a way where I want to help you, might I propose to you that this might be a condition of our hearts more than any external circumstance? Might I suggest to you that when you truly ask yourself, are you a good neighbor, and you want to justify yourself, you want to say, well, this was my week, and this is what happened. I didn't have this growing up. And you begin to justify yourself. Might I suggest, yes, you have a difficult life. Yes, things might be bad. But there might be a condition of the heart that isn't right before God that's causing you to feel guilty for not living out what we know we ought to do. I want to end with this in Psalm 51.10. King David wrote this, a beautiful psalm, and one verse in it says this, Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. To truly follow the words of Jesus in Mark 16.15, to go into all the world, the problem It's not your feet. The problem is not your finances. 
The problem isn't your availability. It's not that you're too busy. It's not your physical body. It's not that you don't have enough education. It's not that you're not tall enough or you're too short or you're this or you're that. that, that none of that is ever the problem. Typically, the problem starts in our heart. And in this psalm, King David asks for forgiveness. Earlier you read it, he asked for forgiveness from God. And yes, sin can cause us to be separated from God. But when David in the psalm asked to create in me a clean heart, at this point in the psalm, he wasn't asking for forgiveness of sin. He was asking for a renewal of his spiritual indifference, of being lukewarm. And many times in life, when we don't have the passion, when it's just not in our hearts, we become what the Bible calls lukewarm. I like to say it like this, we're spiritually indifferent. And we just, eh, do I need to help them? I know Jesus said to go, but it's an issue of the heart. Even King David needed to be spiritually renewed, just like each of us. So as we get ready to end and sing one more song, what I want to do is just pray Psalm 5110 over each of us. And maybe wherever you are, you're listening, you're watching, you're at home, you're in the car, whatever you're doing, there may be an issue of the heart that God wants to renew, to restore, so we could be good neighbors. Let me pray for you. Lord, I just pray, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, forgive me, forgive us of spiritual indifference, of lukewarm, of not really caring. Give us a spiritual renewal this morning. Lord, I just ask that you would begin to create a steadfast spirit in us. A spirit that's loyal, that's faithful, and that's committed. Restore in us again the joy of serving you and serving others. Lord, that wherever we go, we could be a good neighbor. Let's stop asking ourselves, who is my neighbor? And start asking ourselves a real question. Am I a good neighbor? In Jesus' name.